You know, spiritual and personal growth can feel really hard, especially as you are becoming aware of your limiting beliefs and blocks, but haven't yet learned how to transform them. And a lot of people are using psychedelics and plant medicines to accelerate their personal growth and to heal their traumas. But are these tools actually safe? Are they actually effective? And are they right for you? Now, over the course of the last decade, I built a $30 million transformational coaching company and have self-experimented utilizing every form of behavioral psychology, somatic release, breath work, and these tools. And in this episode, I'm going to tell you how you can, if you choose, use psychedelics to heal the deep trauma that is still preventing you from feeling free to create the vision you have for your life. I'm going to be sharing with you the one thing that once I understood it really accelerated my personal growth and my healing by 10x and the big misunderstanding around these tools that keeps a lot of people who are using them stuck or worse yet, really creating a lot of unnecessary harm. And so if this is something that's been interesting you in this episode, you're going to hopefully get clear on whether or not you should use psychedelics or plant medicine in your healing journey, what the experience is like, what medicine you may decide to use. And I'm also going to be talking about any of the negative outcomes, downsides to doing this. But ultimately, the goal here is to help provide you information on how to grow faster spiritually. And I'm going to be sharing a lot of my own personal experience, starting with this story of my first experience. I had felt an urge to uh, explore using these kinds of tools and was first exposed to MDMA. And MDMA is known as the street drug ecstasy. Uh, this is something that I experienced in my youth when I was in college, but had never used therapeutically. And I had a friend who was a very troubled person who was living through a lot of trauma dramatically transform as a result of MDMA therapy. And so I decided to commit to six sessions of MDMA therapy. This was facilitated by a practitioner. And a, a practitioner is a very loose term. Uh, this was not a therapist. This was somebody who had been trained uh, on how to facilitate an MDMA session, which simply consisted of um, supporting me while I was there, bearing witness to my experience, making sure that if anything, quote unquote, went wrong, that I was taken care of. Uh, and the experience for me was to blindfold myself in a quiet room uh, with a playlist <laughs> that she had. A friend of mine once joked, anybody can be a shaman. All you need is uh, some ayahuasca and a playlist. Um, as I uh, dosed very specific dosages of MDMA, and these were dosages that had been used in clinical trials. There's a tremendous renaissance going on now with a lot of people uh, using some form of psychedelic. MDMA is what I would call a soft psychedelic. You can have a hallucinogenic experience, but it's actually, it's not a, a natural medicine like psilocybin and mushrooms or ayahuasca, which I'll get into in a moment here. It's a synthetic medicine that was created, I believe, and again, I'm not a doctor, I'm just sharing what I think I know in my own experience, uh, was a German doctor who had developed this um, chemical compound uh, to help create intimacy between couples. And so uh, here I was in a quiet room by myself with someone who could support me in case anything went wrong. And I took two doses of MDMA. The first dose was, of course, at the beginning and then about an hour later. And what I experienced was um, similar to what I experienced in college, this feeling of ecstasy, uh, this incredible feeling of safety and excitement and adrenaline uh, and a flood of serotonin in my, uh, in my system uh, and really feeling like I was on the beginning of a roller coaster ride. But unlike being distracted, like when I was out at the nightclubs in my early 20s, um, I, I was just going within. And as I started feeling safe, I started having memories that I had never had access to before. These were uh, memories that were very uncomfortable. So while I was in this cocoon of ecstasy, I was also feeling a lot of these very uncomfortable emotions. One of the memories I had was uh, as, as being a child and just feeling like there was something wrong with me. 
I actually started speaking out loud as if I was a little child. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. And it was a pretty extraordinary experience because as I was sort of chanting, there's something wrong with me, feeling that feeling, right, of, of that so many of us have of not being enough or not being good enough or feeling like there's something wrong with us. I watched as a timeline unfolded and I saw my 17-year-old self saying, there's something wrong with me, there's something wrong with me. And my 23-year-old self saying, there's something wrong with me and there's something wrong with me. And, and memories that matched, there's this something wrong with me. I remember being on the playground as a kid in the fifth grade. I guess I must have been around, uh, geez, I don't know, nine years old, 10 years old. And we had moved to a new school district far away from where I had grown up. And so I was on the playground with new kids. And I remember being pressed up against the chain link fence, watching them play dodgeball on the dodgeball court. And that separation between myself and them and that shyness and feeling like there was something wrong with me. And so I had all of these memories start to emerge and these feelings throughout these different stages of my development, there was something wrong with me. And at this time, I think I was around 45, 46 years old. And I had been experiencing some chronic health challenges. And so then all of a sudden, as my 45 or 46 year old version, I was saying to myself, there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. And what came to mind was this feeling of an absence of well-being, the experience of these chronic health conditions that I was having saying there's something wrong with me. And, and so in this process, I had this extraordinary awareness that the limiting belief, this very core program that I had developed or learned that there's something wrong with me was actually manifesting in my body as there's something wrong with me. Now I had something I could point at. See, there's something wrong with me. I've got neuropathy in my feet. I've got heart palpitations. I've got back problems. I've, I had a double hernia. There's something wrong with me. And I realized, oh my God, all of these manifestations in my body are actually not physical problems. They're psycho-emotional uh, their root is in, in, in a psycho-emotional misunderstanding that there, there's something wrong with me. And, it, and, and, and the experience within taking the MDMA, which lasted about four hours, was very like peaks and valleys. Uh, there would be these waves, and it was almost like a new chapter was unfolding for me. And so um, w within this chapter, I also, as I bore witness to all of these memories that I, I didn't even remember and all of these feelings that I had never fully processed, as I was feeling them and processing them, I also became aware that I learned this from my mom. You know, my mother had a mother who was abusive to her. My mother concluded based on that abuse that there was something wrong with her. My mother grew up uh, or my mother modeled that throughout my childhood and I learned that behavior and my mom too had chronic health problems. My mom was also manifesting there's something wrong with her through her body. And so this was a tremendous awareness and then this sort of this chapter which lasted about 15 to 20 minutes is one of the cycles in my MDMA therapy session um, kind of concluded with this extraordinary release of, uh, of, of, of emotions and, uh, and I felt this inner peace. I, I actually felt for the first time that there was nothing wrong with me at all, that this was just a great misunderstanding that had materialized into my life. And then I was using my life as evidence to reinforce this idea that there was something wrong with me and that I'd been caught up in this loop. Uh, and in the course of this uh, 15 to 20 minutes, I realized that none of that was uh, actually ever true. And so my experience with MDMA uh, in particular, uh, is that it helped me identify, well, I guess what I would say is we all have blocks that are hard to access or that we're not aware of because the subconscious mind has suppressed them. And of course, in order to transform them, in order to heal and grow and in order to remove the resistance so that you can not only feel better in your life, but create more in your business or stop attracting toxic relationships or heal your body or generate more prosperity and abundance, you have to become aware of them and then work with them. So in order to transform them, you have to know what they are. And psychedelics put the brain in a state of safety so that you can access those memories and ideas. And oftentimes, even in the midst of the experience itself, you can begin to rewire 
the misunderstanding and let go of the trauma or the resistance. They've done some uh, brain scans and brain studies of people who have used ayahuasca. Uh, ayahuasca, uh, which is also something that I've uh, used uh, in several ceremonies, is uh, an indigenous tea. Uh, it was created by the indigenous people in the Amazon. So there's different traditions around it, Peruvian traditions, Ecuadorian traditions, Colombian traditions. Uh, and somehow, you know, a thousand years ago or thousands of years ago, the indigenous people found a way to combine a couple of different uh, plants in, in order for a human being to ingest a chemical called DMT and to allow it to go through your system. And we all naturally produce DMT in our bodies. It's a very long word. You can Google it, diothemexyl something something. Again, not a doctor or a scientist, just a guy on the journey sharing my experience with you. Um, we all have DMT in our body that is inactive. Uh, what's interesting, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, is that you can activate the DMT stores in your body naturally uh, through a very specific type of breath work and have the same type of experiences that you can have using MDMA or psilocybin or ayahuasca without having to use any of these chemicals or medicines. And, uh, but the, the brain studies that were done uh, as, as people were ingesting uh, ayahuasca, this tea, uh, and taking in the active form of DMT, is that the DMT stimulated parts of the brain that are normally not active. And so as a result of that stimulation, other parts of the brain became inactive. And there's a set of components within your brain that are referred to as the default mode network. And the default mode network is essentially, you know, as you develop as a, in, an individual in the world, um, you, you come in a, in a blank slate and you start uh, learning through the experiences of your life and giving meaning to the experiences of your life. And so you're giving, you know, meaning to the experience with, with a dog as dogs are friendly. You're giving a meaning uh, to the experience of money as you observe it when you're growing up and you experience your parents and their interaction with money potentially is like money is hard to make. And you're giving meanings to the experience you have of yourself, right? I'm not good enough, or there's something wrong with me, or there's not enough time, or you have to make the right or wrong decisions. And these meanings start to shape the lens through which you experience life, and you become someone who is shaped by those meanings, and that becomes your personality. And you begin to think only within the context of your personality. Right, We hear that from neuroscience or psychology that we think the same thoughts over and over again every single day. And so there's this construct that's created, which is called the default mode network, that is essentially, you can think about it as your Microsoft operating system. And it's helpful because it's an operating system, so it allows you to operate in, with some level of function and to survive, but it's also very, very limiting. And hey, it's David, just a quick interruption to your regularly scheduled episode by your favorite sponsor. I want to tell you about my book. It is available on Amazon right here, right now. A changed mind, go beyond self-awareness, rewire your brain and re-engineer your reality. In this little book are all the frameworks, the tools, the methodologies that I talk about on this show and that I've used to actually change my mind and that tens of thousands of other people have used to transform their bank accounts, their businesses, their relationships, their health, their spiritual connection, everything that you want to achieve, this is the way to achieve it. And Amazon has done us a good one right now. It's significantly discounted. So you can go and pick up your copy or better yet, pick up a copy for a friend too. There's nothing better than giving the gift of transformation right now hop on over to amazon there's a link in the show notes and if you love the book as much as i loved writing it for you do me a favor let me know that and leave a review and now back to your regularly scheduled episode so what dmt does in its active form is it simulates stimulates different parts of the brain and turns off other parts of the brain so that the default mode network comes down essentially your personality relaxes you, the, the protective mechanisms of your conscious mind go offline for a little bit. And what's interesting is that as, as, you, as, as this change takes place in your operating system, many people describe having what are referred to as hallucinogenic experiences. Uh, hallucinogenic experiences might be, you know, I had a conversation with a loved one who was passed or, you know, I felt God or I saw that it was an angel with wings 
um, people refer to these as hallucinogenic experiences. Uh, I prefer the term entheogenic. Entheogenic essentially means an experience that is other than ordinary. Because hallucinogenic sort of implies that whatever it is you're experiencing in ceremony or in a session with these tools isn't really happening. But what I believe, it doesn't mean it's right, but I'm just sharing this with you, is that as the default mode network comes down, we, we experience extrasensory perception. In other words, we become very dependent upon our five senses. Our five senses are very closely oriented with this default mode network, which is very closely oriented with the way that we believe the world works and our perception of ourselves and our personality. And when, when these medicines begin to shift around the electrical activity of your brain and your nervous system, we're able to tap into senses that we've always had, but that are not frequently used, that are dormant because our predominant five senses have become so dominant over time. Like we know that uh, other animals have other senses. They're able to see beyond the visible light spectrum. They're able to hear things that we can't hear. And we know that there's information uh, beyond our five senses, we can look at like spect- spectrography, spectrography, I think it's called, where we can like look at a plant and we can cut off a leaf and we can still see the energetic vibration of the leaf there. So there is, um, there's an entire world of information that exists around us at all times that we have access to when we're not locked into the traditional container of the way the default mode network or the mind is working. And these tools allow us to start accessing that information. And so for example, in an, in an ayahuasca ceremony that I participated in, uh, again, almost like chapters in a book, there were peaks and valleys over the course of six hours. I took the ceremonial tea the particular story I'm referencing is in Costa Rica where I worked with, you know, real shamans, not just a guy with a playlist and a refrigerator with ayahuasca in it, but shamans who have come down through these lineages over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and who have used um, ayahuasca, this medicine, to for healing purposes because they believed or understood that all physical symptoms in the body were unresolved psychological and emotional issues that you didn't really have a health challenge. You had a, you had a spiritual problem. (laughs) Um, and, uh, in one of these ceremonies, I was able to have a very deep conversation with my mom where she explained to me the pain that she suffered as a child. And I was able to understand at, at a much deeper level why my mother is the way that she is. And in that conversation, uh, found a tremendous forgiveness for her. And in the forgiveness for her, I no longer held the resentments that I was holding that were causing all kinds of problems in my life. Uh, in that same ceremony, I, I recently, my, my favorite furry friend had recently passed. I had a chihuahua named Dexter. He was with me through my drug and alcohol recovery. He was, he was with me with the before David and the after David. Um, the David and his, uh, early thirties and the David after my recovery and my personal growth and my, my spiritual growth and Dexter had recently passed and I I missed Dexter tremendously. And I had an experience where as I was touching my own face with my hand, my index finger started to rub against my cheek. And all of a sudden I had an awareness because I wasn't controlling it. It was just happening. I was surrendering to my body moving within this medicine experience that, that, that was Dexter licking my face. And, and I just knew it to be true. And, um, you know, is there, is there value in that? There was for me. And, um, and so these, these, these tools give us access to information that we are blocked off from, both because the mind develops a habit over time and locks into its operating system, and because a lot of these memories... Um, were pushed down into the subconscious mind along with the unprocessed emotions associated with them uh, because we were threatened and it didn't feel safe. You know, because we experienced sexual abuse or physical abuse or emotional abuse. I didn't understand how to process that information properly. It got stored down into the subconscious mind, but the subconscious mind is like the power generator that's determining 
the conscious decisions that we're making it's 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 really like the the power that is reflecting itself out through our belief systems our thoughts our emotions and our actions and so it's reflecting back to us in the dysfunction of our life through health challenges or business challenges or relationship challenges and if we want to be able to change our external reality we have to be able to access this material that is the root cause of what we're materializing or manifesting externally and these tools can give us access to it. Now, one of the big mistakes that I see a lot of people making is that they believe that the psychedelic experience is the breakthrough. And so they go have a, a, an experience where there is a feeling of breakthrough and then they go back to their lives. But they go back to their lives not realizing, in my opinion, that the experience and ceremony or in the medicine work is to give you a glimpse or an understanding. And now there's a, a piece called integration that's very, very important. Your life is going to continue to reflect back to you these unprocessed traumas. Most of the time, the medicine doesn't resolve the trauma for you. The medicine helps you become aware of what the trauma is and may give you a deeper understanding of what really took place at that time. And so now you can take that information back into your life but those, those habits and those patterns of emotions, of thoughts, of electrical vibration in your system are still there. And so you're still producing undesired results or contrasted experiences in your life. And the medicine work that you do or the therapy that you do gives you access to be with that experience differently. But it doesn't prevent the experiences from occurring. And so most people think that the psychedelic experience is the breakthrough. They go back into their life they're not actually utilizing the information that they gained to work with the challenges of their life. And so the tension builds back up and they have to keep going back to psychedelics. And so it's important to understand that these are just tools. They're not some sort of panacea cure-all. And that's the mistake that I see a lot of people making. There's a lot of information out there around, well, you know, people have been alcoholics or drug addicts and they go have one ayahuasca ceremony or one psilocybin ser uh, session and, and, and they never want to drink or pick up again. Um, I've seen a different story. I've seen a lot of people who think that it's like a one and done and it's not. It's a one and now the work begins. Or for me, it was a six sessions of MDMA over the course of a year and slowly integrating what I had learned back into my real life experience. Because again, if your unconscious mind is producing the results of your life, if, if, you're, if your unresolved beliefs and your unresolved traumas are creating experiences that you don't want, of course you're creating lots of experiences that you do because you have empowered belief systems. But if they're creating what you don't want, then now the work is to take that, that education that you've received through the therapy or through the medicine and bring it into your life. I had a friend who was a very successful CEO and um, she started getting into this medicine work and she'd go do a ceremony. She'd kind of blow off some steam. She'd gain some understandings. Then she'd get back to work. Then the tension would build back up. And the next thing you know, she's like laying on some banana leaf in the Amazon, you know, drinking tea with some shamans again. <laughs> and she, she did like, I don't know what it was, 40, 50, 60 ceremonies. Uh, and she had this wonderful revelation, which I think articulates this point really well, where she came back one day and business was tense and things were building up. And she's like, I got to get back down to the jungle and do some more medicine. And um, when, when in the process of, of, of ayahuasca, it's referred to as a ceremony, right? A ceremony because there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of protocol to it. There's a cleansing of the space. Uh, the shamans are working with you. There's indigenous music. It's really, for me, it's a very beautiful experience. It's referred to as a ceremony. So she's like, I got to get down and do another ceremony. And she had this awareness that life is the ceremony. So life is the ceremony. Life is the hallucinogenic experience. <laughs> you know, Einstein said reality is an illusion, albeit a persistent one. You know, we're creating our own realities and we're having a physical, very physical experience, even though we know that the material world is made up of a bunch of things that aren't even really here, right? Like molecules down to atoms, down to photons. It's like we're really living in more of like this matrix-like reality of shimmering light, yet our senses are interpreting it to create a physical experience. So we're spiritual beings having a, having a false physical experience. That's the illusion, and it's the opportunity for us to do the work because 
as a as a byproduct of the fact that we create our own reality, we're we're creating circumstances and situations that when we meet them and when they trigger us, trigger us, they bring up belief systems in the form of our reactions. And those beliefs are actually the beliefs that created them. They're the cause, not the effect. And so once you have a new context for what this belief is really about, right? Oh, there's something wrong with me in reaction to my physical problems. Now I can work with it. And this was a massive game changer for me and my own understanding because I started using these tools thinking that they were the things that were going to heal me. I'm the thing that's going to heal me. Me in relationship and in faith with my higher power, the, the only power that there really is, that's what's going to heal me. That's what's going to make me rich. That's what's going to allow me to achieve my full potential. That's what's going to help me create and nurture healthy, intimate relationships. Nothing outside of me is going to do that. These are just tools that give me a glimpse. And that's when I really started to 10x my spiritual growth. I realized that there wasn't something outside of me that was going to fix me. I realized that these tools can be nice to give me access to information that then I have to put to work into the day-to-day -day experiences of my life if I really want to create change. Because change comes from in the moment of experiencing something that is uncomfortable for you, learning how to relax, learning how to have a different experience with the discomfort. And that's a new rep. It's a new repetition. It's just like going to the gym. This information that we gain, and sometimes a little bit of the lightening of the load, when we use these tools, whether it's psychedelics or plant medicine or MDMA, <laughs> they give us access to doing more reps in our day-to-day -day life. They give us a perspective that gives us permission to go, okay, I'm gonna relax around this. I know that the, I know that my reaction right now is just an old habit. I know that the meaning that I'm giving this experience isn't true. Let me just breathe through this, right? It's very much like a yogic practice. And every time we choose to do that, rather than react out of the old trauma or the old limiting belief, it's a new rep in the, in the direction of a down-regulated nervous system. So we're learning how to, and this is very, very cool, take control of things that we thought we had no control of, like the functions of the autonomic nervous system, our heart rate, our breathing, our reaction, whether we move into fight or flight. We're learning how to become responsive, which is the next evolution of the human being, rather than reactive, which is sort of the mammal that we've been. And so uh, these tools can support you in um, developing this practice. And a lot of people say, well, sh should I do it? And my answer is, well, do you want to? Because l life provides us a lot of roads to the mountaintop. And, you know, ultimately, you do not need to use any of these medicines or tools if you don't want to. I have a lot of friends in recovery who absolutely will not use these tools because they look at them as drugs and they're afraid that they may become addicted to them. Now, I don't know, other, other than becoming addicted to thinking that ayahuasca is going to fix you, I do know some people who are probably doing too many ceremonies, but it is not a pleasant experience. You know, the ayahuasca experience is very different than the MDMA experience. The ayahuasca experience is a lot of purging and throwing up and crapping yourself. And I don't know anybody who gets addicted to that. Um, I, I'm terrified every time I go into an ayahuasca ceremony because it's, a, it's very challenging for me what comes up. It doesn't have the safe feeling of MDMA, yet I, I can see that there's been some benefit to it in my own experience. But you know, it's been five years since I've done um, any of this work because I'm, I'm at a point now where I realize that you know, my, my growth is up to me. It's not up to a pill or a potion or a tool. Those were, those were things that you know, got me here, but they're not going to get me to the next level. And in fact, the things that are getting me to the next level are things like my 12-step recovery, um, principles for living, uh, the, the work that we teach. And you know, if this is your first time on this channel, we've got a ton of videos with tools around personal growth and my perspective on human evolution. If, if you're not new to this channel, you know, you know that, that this is what I'm spending 100% of my time on right now. Um, and as I mentioned before, there are other tools like transformational bre breath work. Uh, you know, one of my breath mentors, Ali Asivi, who comes to my retreats and intensives and works with my high-level coaching clients, I practice with her every, I don't know, once or twice a month. And when we get into deep breath work, 
we activate the um, natural stores of DMT that are in my system and I have profound entheogenic experiences, you know, laying on my bed on Zoom, uh, breathing for 45 minutes with her uh, and having incredible um, releases and awarenesses and breakthroughs. I've had breakthroughs sitting in extreme heat in my sauna. I had a recollection of a past life memory that gave me tremendous perspective on why I'm being reactive in a certain way uh, in my life right now. And so that awareness is now something I can take into those triggering moments and being with those triggering moments differently. Being responsive rather than reactive. Certain meditations, certain yoga practices um, can also produce the same types of breakthroughs and the same types of results. So, you know, this isn't for everyone, but I know that there are a lot of people who have, who have questions around it. And so I wanted to be able to speak into it from my own personal experience. I would also say that the, the biggest, if not one of the biggest components of my spiritual growth and healing journey is being in fellowship with other people who are on the journey with me. I get that out of 12 step. I get that out of our whole human framework program and our community. Um, being with other people who are in a similar form of spiritual practice, who are learning tools and using tools, um, who can share with me their wins, um, who can also share with me their struggles. So it reminds me of the fact that we're all going to have good days and bad days. Fellowship, connection is a very important part of this. There's an energy to connection. You know, life itself is one big connected matrix. And when we isolate, that's when we cut ourselves off from the healing process as well. So I hope you've loved this episode. Thanks for joining me and allowing me to share all of this with you. Um, if you love this video, I'll give you a couple more here that you can check out. Uh, and if you haven't yet, do me a favor. If you really, really love this episode, I want to get this work out to as many people as possible. If you're listening on the audio platforms on Apple, leave me a rating and a review. If you're on Spotify, drop me uh, a, a rating. Uh, and if you're on YouTube, hey, thanks for being here. Subscribe, hit the bell icon um, so that we can go deeper into the conversations that matter most. Thanks for joining me in today's episode of A Changed Mind. I love you and I'll see you in the next episode. Hey, it's David. Hop on over to davidbear.com. Click right here. There's also a link in the show notes and sign up for our newsletter. You'll get immediate access to my free Mind Hack ebook as well. A couple of trainings to help you master the inner game. This is a great way to stay informed and be a part of our community and be notified of special announcements. Click below, head on over to the website, get subscribed. If you loved this video, make sure you check out this one or this one and I will see you in the next video.